Each year, 24 Hours of Reality brings the world together for one full day to talk about the reality of the climate crisis and how we can solve it. Today, you can become a citizen producer of this live broadcast and have your name appear in the closing credits. Don't miss your chance to support this world-changing broadcast. Visit 24HoursOfReality.org to learn how. Our next guest is an editor at Rolling Stone Magazine, where I work, and the author of The Water Will Come, Rising Seas, Sinking Cities, and the Remaking of the Civilized World. Please welcome my colleague and friend, Jeff Goodell. Good to see you, Jeff. Hey, Jamil, good to see you too. So, we obviously we know each other from working together at Rolling Stone, but I wanna know more about this book. Uh, the Water Will Come, Rising Seas, Sinking Cities, and the Reshaping of the Civilized World. What would you say is the key finding of your book? Well, I think, you know, the, the most important thing that I kind of discovered about um, while I was reporting this book, and I, and I think is sort of widely misunderstood about um, the risks of sea level rise, is that um, this is something that is already kind of baked into the system. You know, we've talked a lot about the importance of cutting carbon emissions and and uh, and all of that, and that's important for all the reasons that you know we've been talking about on the show um, for hours now. But it's also really important to understand that from a sea level rise point of view, you know, this is already kind of a done deal. Um, it doesn't mean that cutting carbon emissions isn't important because uh, it can certainly slow the trajectory over the long term. But we have, you know, depending on uh, certainly five to six feet of sea level rise sort of baked into the system now, which is a really, really big deal uh, and really important to think about because it means that, you know, we really have to think both about how do we cut carbon pollution as quickly as possible, but also how do we begin adapting to a different world because that's what we're making for ourselves. And I think sea level rise is sort of emblematic of that. Now, to research your book, you traveled the globe extensively interviewing scientists. You traveled to Alaska with former United States President Barack Obama to investigate the extent to which the climate crisis and rising sea levels will impact humanity. What did you find and how dire is that situation overall? Well, you know, it's, you know, one of the things about sea level rise is that it's different uh, everywhere, right? I mean, so we have a global sea level rise that, we're, that, that scientists talk about. And, you know, the range right now is, you know, between, say, three to seven feet or so, one to two meters by the end of the century, and it'll continue going after that, depending on what we do with carbon emissions. Um, but it's also the, the thinking about the risks and economic costs of, of sea level rise is very different in different places. Um, so, for example, I spent a lot of time uh, reporting this book in Miami, Florida, uh, where you have a lot of really uh, high value real estate and a lot of population living in a very flat area. Uh, and not only that, you have uh, Miami sort of built on a kind of porous limestone that's basically like Swiss cheese, which makes it very difficult to um, build seawalls or other kind of protections. So the risks in a place like uh, Miami are very different than, say, uh, um, another example is a place like Jakarta, uh, which is also low-lying, but it also happens to be subsiding or sinking. The land happens to be sinking itself, which exacerbates the risks of sea level rise. So there, there's much greater sort of urgency there. And then, you know, you could compare it to a place like New York, which everyone saw with Hurricane Sandy, um, has, you know, a lot uh, at risk from storm surges and sea level rise, but also has a lot of high ground that one can imagine, you know, sort of migrating to and a lot of money, obviously, in New York to spend on sea level defenses. So one of the most important things I realized and learned is that um, this story uh, plays out differently everywhere. Uh, even though it's a global story, every sort of city and locale uh, has an individual narrative. Yes, I was reporting in Miami recently, and I know that you know certainly it has entered into the, the dialogue of our politicians as well. I wanted to know what you found in reporting your book and throughout your overall reporting. How has this talk about rising sea levels entered our political dialogue as you've seen it? Well, I mean, it's starting to enter into our political dialogue in a very tangible way because people are f experiencing the flooding, like wildfires and like heat extremes. This is one of the manifestations of 
climate change in the here and now. It's another example of how this is not a distant, faraway future event. This is an event that we're beginning to see and experience in real time. And I think that with um, increased flooding in a lot of uh, regional, in a lot of regions, we're seeing people who are experiencing more and more floods with, in the United States with these hurricanes and the bigger storm surges that come with that. So it's starting to drive politicians to think about, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to deal with this? Um, in South Florida, you're starting to see, you know, uh, the city of Miami Beach spent $500 million to in increase drainage and um, install an elaborate system of, of uh, pumps to help pump the water out and elevating streets. And, you know, uh, one of the things that's driving this is a lot of concern in, in coastal communities around the world uh, that people will begin to leave. Um, and mm. so as people leave, uh, there, there's obvious costs uh, to the economy, to the tax base. And so there's a lot of political effort put in trying to convince people to stay and convincing them that, you know, we can deal with these risks. We can build seawalls. We can help with the drainage. We can, we can elevate buildings. We can do all these things so that our community, our city will be viable for, you know, the coming decades. Now, of course, Jeff, there are naysayers and climate deniers in every culture. Maybe some have a hard time imagining science as the future holds maybe some have a political end. What, in your experience, is the best way to convince people who might not understand what rising sea levels mean for their respective communities? Uh, well, I think the best way is to, like, go hang out at Miami Beach on King Tides <laughs> and see Amen. what's going on for yourself. Um, you know, uh, when you see, you know, three feet of water in Miami Beach on a sunny day, you get a sense that something's going on. Um, but, you know, I, I, I myself as a, as a journalist and someone who's written about this and thought about this a lot, I, I, I think that for me um, there's a certain subset of people who, who don't want to believe this and, you know, the water will be rising up around their chins and they'll still uh, not believe that this is done, uh, that this is anything related to what humans are doing with burning fossil fuels or anything. I'm really trying to address and think about and help uh, people understand, people who get that climate change is an issue, that it is caused by humans, that, uh, that it is a result of our burning fossil fuels and other human practices, but don't really understand the urgency of the risks. And I think uh, talking about sea level rise is a really good um, way of thinking about that and understanding that because it's pretty easy to visualize, um, you know, and think about what a city like, you know, Venice or Jakarta or Shanghai or Miami looks like with three or four or five feet of sea level rise. It doesn't take, you know, a, a really vivid imagination to understand what a big problem that is. Indeed. Uh, I remember reading a dystopic graphic novel where it envisioned a big wall outside of Santa Monica here in Los Angeles uh, to protect against the rising Pacific Ocean. Uh, you've been writing about this for a very long time, for about 15 years. What, in your opinion, are the actual practical solutions for dealing with these rising sea levels? Well, I think there, there's, you know, a whole variety of solutions, and they're different in every place. Um, uh, some places, you know, like Lower Manhattan, for example, I'm sure that there will be elaborate sea walls built. Um, because it's the most valuable real estate in the world. Um, and there's a kind of granite foundation that would allow that. Um, in places like Venice, you see these attempts at building large barriers outside the lagoon area to try to keep um, sea levels at bay. Um, they're talking about building different kinds of barriers uh, uh, on the Thames to protect London. Um, you know, in some places in the Netherlands, they're experimenting with, you know, floating structures. I think there's going to be a variety of solutions. Um, I think that things like, you know, you mentioned a seawall outside of Santa Monica. I mean, I think that that's highly unlikely. And I think that walls are very problematic for a lot of reasons, um, social justice issues being one of them. Um, you know, if you're building a wall in Lower Manhattan and the wall ends at 42nd Street and you live on, you know, downtown on 25th Street, you're, you're happy, you feel safe behind the wall. Mm -hmm. If you're on 50th Street, you're wondering why the wall didn't go up there. And if you're living in Red Hook, Brooklyn, uh, you know, there's not going to be Danish 
architects out there you know, building billion dollar walls to protect you. And right. so there's an immediate question is, okay, well, why do they get the wall and we don't? Um, there's a lot of complexity in this, and, and there's a lot of complexity in, in, a, in, a, in region to region area. But I think the big thing that we're going to see, the really important overview, is that there's going to be retreat. People are going to leave from coastal areas. There will be adaptation, there will be seawalls, there will be all kinds of innovation and interesting structures and floating this and that. But there will also be people who leave. Um, and there will be people who are, who are left behind in flooding areas who don't have the means to, to retreat. And I think that the, as, this, uh, as we move into thinking more about this and as the waters begin to rise more and more, we're going to see more and more what a huge social justice issue this is. Indeed. Uh, Jeff Cadell, contributing editor to Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, thank you very much, my friend and colleague. Appreciate you joining us.